So I want to talk about how to be safe, really. And it's not just the knees, it's of everything. And the first one I would always say is be fit. Our biggest issue is seeing people who come to our clinics after they've been injured and they look they look unfit before they walk through the door and you can see why they've got injured. Skiing is actually a fairly intense, fairly active sport. If you're not fit enough to do it, at least modify what you do and don't overdo it. Next one will come as a dismay to some people. I say, you don't drink and drive, you don't drink and ski. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple, because if you're doing 30 miles an hour, you wouldn't do it on the M25 in London, you shouldn't do it on the M25 here. It, it, I'll, I'll show you some data as well. Uh, if anybody ever says to me, it's time for one last run before we go, to, we go home, I've gone. Never go out for that last run, it seems like it fated to be uh, If you want to ski, learn, get taught. <coughs> that way, you wouldn't go and do anything without learning about it. And, and you can improve your experience and have a far better time, so tuition is really important. Next thing, don't overestimate your ability. Um, a lot of British skiers go into ski shops and say, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good, and they, they will immediately give you a kit that is inappropriate for you. They'll cramp your bindings up, they'll make them really tight, and you're much more likely to become injured. If you want to ski off piste, please, please get a guide and go and do it properly and look after yourself. Um, please wear a helmet. The data's all there for helmets now as to why you should. The Arberg data is fantastic. And even the Americans are now starting to wear helmets, it seems. And if you're going to go off piste, you have to take the safety kit. So airbag, for me, is an, I think, actually added to the list. <coughs> Shovel, probe, and transceiver, absolutely. And if you don't know how to use a transceiver and do a search, you shouldn't be there. Um, that's my little quickie about drinking. So, power coal concentration, 43% of 200 injuries. Okay, so nearly half are drunk. Mm. Enough said. <coughs> Where's the most dangerous place in the ski resort? Chairlift. Most of you will know this already. I always sit on the edge of the chairlift. The moment it lands, I'm gone. And the reason we don't like it is it's low velocity. You get people who get tangled up. As you're rotated around, you're guaranteed to twist coming. Next thing, tobogganing. Big thing here for some restaurant up the mountain. And there will be toboggans down, especially at night. Not anymore. Ban now. Is it banned? Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, tobogganing is, has provided the worst injuries I've ever seen on ski slopes. Because people go down again, often they may be alcohol involved, but they their leg is a break and then they post in the snow and suddenly the foot that was in front of them is now back here <coughs> and they tend to injure everything including the nerves and the arteries so it's not just bones and tips of tissue and they can be catastrophic life changing injuries so I'm delighted we've stopped that. Um, how often do people get injured? Well basically it's one, per, one injury per 10,000 lift runs and the average skier only does 10 runs a day. I never realised that. So it's about you know, one every ten seconds. So we find this has been consistently shown across the whole world as well. The data is the same. What are we noticing from this thing? Well, people are getting heavier, which is a problem. Are people are going faster. That snowfall actually reduces the high energy injuries because if it's powder, people don't go as quickly. If it's icy and hard, people are going very quickly. We know that the kit is so much better that people now can actually turn the skis that they couldn't do all those years ago. Those two, two meter 30 skis that were thin. <coughs> you had to actually really know what you're doing to be able to turn them. Now with the parabolic cut, you can cut a corner very easily. So it's very interesting to see the change in the dynamic of people skiing and the change in their health and the change in their weights. So they're all heavier, everybody's heavier. It also depends what you want to do, so that's my idea of a good day, but other people like different things. They want to pot around with some blue runs and red runs, have a lovely lunch in a restaurant, have a really lovely time out of it, which is fantastic. So why does it happen to the knee? It's because you rotate, you've got a six foot plank attached to your, your foot, there's a huge rotational force, and then the binding should release. And they have a release point and you have to get the right, right point, the right velocity and the right force at that moment. It's different in touring bindings, they don't release the same way. Um, 
female injury is more common for a lot of reasons, anatomy, physiology, hormonal inferences, and ligamental strength, they're all a bit different. Ski boots are all different. <coughs> and obviously the old days, they had those laced up leather boots, and they all fractured just below, above the ankle. They had the horrendous injuries from that time. Now we've nicely taken that solid ski boot that goes up here, and it's transferred for the, most of the force up to the knee. And it's very rare to have an injury inside the ski boot. We know that overall knee supports don't seem to change how the knee works. It doesn't have a massive effect on proprioception. Uh, my name is Steve Corbett. I'm one of the shoulder surgeons at uh, Forties. Um, I am one of the original members as well. I still work at Guys and St Thomas's NHS. Um, so why shoulders? Well, you saw Andrew with his knee. And he described me as doing this and a little bit of that. Well, this one does a lot more things. <laughs> <laughs> much more complicated, much more sort of, you've got to be at your top of your game. <laughs> also, also, I'm the only person who's speaking tonight who isn't injured. So, <laughs> so, so obviously here we are in a beautiful resort as opposed to sort of London or uh, north, the north of England. Um, and I know where I'd much rather be, and clearly there's a lot of people in this room who would prefer to be here too. I'm well aware there's a lot of different expertise in this room. Hopefully there's something in the talk for everybody. So, as Andrew was saying, you know, injuries to the shoulder are no different to injuries elsewhere. Um, they are about 10% wall skiing injuries, 15% of snowboarding injuries, they're potentially twice as common in snowboarders compared to skiers. First day participants, over tw tw twice as likely to, occur, to have an injury. Last day as well, last run, as we heard earlier from Andrew. Higher incidence in uh, adults than children. And use of rented or borrowed equipment. Uh, I'll just borrow your boots or I'll just borrow your skis. <coughs> All adds to your injury risk. The Five main risk factors, again, as Andrew was highlighting, inadequate preparation, physically, increased in females, high skill level, unfavorable genetic predisposition. So things there may be along the lines as if you've got a bone problem, if you've got potentially hyperlaxity, can make, can increase your injury risk, and also your skis. And I'm not an expert on skis, I certainly, um, I'm nowhere to the standard of the other speakers, but I enjoy it. So up, at, up here, how do we injure it? Well, direct impact when you fall on it, or when you are bringing your arm out to the side, like so, this is called abduction. If you then load through your arm like this, or when you rotate round a pole, or like so. Those are the injury sort of patterns that will affect the shoulder. And what are you going to do? Well, you may break a bone, you may injure a joint, or you may injure the soft tissues in the shoulder. So the bony injuries are going to be around the collarbone, the clavicle, the humerus, the top of the humerus, has got an attachment called the tuberosity. Um, scapular fractures are normally much more high in energy injuries, so shoulder blade fractures, if you've got a shoulder blade fracture, you've really hit something hard. Um, in the joint, we've got several joints around the shoulder. We've obviously got the main ball and socket joint, but we've got a joint at the end of the collarbone, and we've got a joint at the other end of the collarbone. So the acromioclavicular joint out here, the AC joint, I've already found two people in the room who've got AC joint injuries, I've only spoken to four. <laughs> <laughs> and the sternoclavicular joint here, again, it's normally a more um, aggressive injury, shall we say, a greater velocity injury. The soft tissues are things like the tendons, the ropes that are going to lift and move your arm around. They are there connecting the muscle to the bone. Or there's a couple of other things which I'll show you in a moment. Or the big muscle groups, your pec, your biceps, your triceps. You can rip any of them. So, sites of dislocation. The most common is the ball and the socket. Elbow, less common. 
the joint on the top of his shoulder, about one in five AC joint injuries. There's a higher fracture dislocation rate in skiers. So not only do you dislocate, say, the wall from the socket, but you also break a bone at the same time. There's a higher incidence of that also if you're doing it more than once, recurrent dislocations. And as we get older, then our injury pattern changes on a dislocation of the ball in the socket. And we become much more likely to tear tendons as well as dislocate. We, we run a, a ski academy, but we, we do a little bit more in the background work where we do a lot of work off of the hill. So a, a lot of our philosophy about ski coaching and about how we, there we go, uh, how we make uh, solutions for people is definitely a lot spent on the mountain, uh, like a lot of you guys here skiing with us in Virgo. But in the recent years, we've started to look closer at how people can empower themselves to coach themselves and to make solutions for their uh, skiing technique. And one of the things that we've always realized in the marketplace that we work in <coughs> is the relationship between us as the ski coaches, um, the, uh, the, the, the ski shops, you know, where people go to get their equipment, um, and the individual themselves, so the biomechanical movement patterns. Um, we've been doing the Ski Technique Lab as a tour for nearly 10 years around the UK. And one of the things that sort of, uh, it's like alarm bells. Um, and, and what these guys do obviously is, is rehab and what we're trying to get to, and the reason we, we have a relationship is, is a prehab. So we want to sort of help people uh, understand and evolve their movement patterns. Um, you've all got this flyer here, here in front of you. Um, <coughs> when you look at this, we, we look at really simple patterns of movement for skiing. So the first one you can see is ankle flex range. Um, when we test people on this range, we, we see that people usually come up short. So most of the stuff that we do when we do in our talks around the UK, um, we would love in the future, we're not, we're not going to test people tonight, we wouldn't have time to do that, but we would love in the future that people almost um, condition themselves for a ski boot fit. So right, you know, some people go to get the ski boot fitted and their, their foot is not physically conditioned uh, to do that. Um, some people can be quite tight in their calf muscles, some people can lack flexibility, but even the muscles around the foot uh, could do with um, some, some education. So that's, that's one area that we see. When we do the, the flex test, we, we often see that people have a, a difference between their left and right uh, range of movement. Okay, so this usually translates straight back into their skiing. And if you got put under pressure, if you're skiing something where you uh, was unpredictable that you hit like a, a cookie and the powder, you know, and, and you slammed it. When we often see these on our, on our talks and our tests that someone has a three or four centimeter difference between left and right, it's usually gonna be one side of the, the leg that's gonna take the brunt of, a, of an injury. Um, ski asymmetry is it's another thing we, we focus on. As the guys were mentioning earlier, you know, MCL, um, ski asymmetry, I mean, most of the people that we teach in, in an academy week will have an A-frame. And that, you know, that, that really goes without saying. Um, and if people had the chance to sort of learn about the, the muscles in the legs that could stabilize the symmetry in the legs, they would actually do a better job than we do as ski coaches on the hill trying to fix someone's A-frame. So if you learn what muscle groups can stabilize your legs, then, then you get a, a big feedback. We do a thing on here called a 10 second test, which is very slowly trying to pull your feet towards each other. And uh, what we found over the years of doing these tests, uh, uh, ski shows and talks, is that people's legs actually shake, you know, when they're trying to do this test. So, so we know that people aren't uh, pre-equipped with a specific range uh, in, in their legs to stabilize that movement pattern. Um, and the third one is probably one of the most important ones, which is leg steering range. And we, we often find that people have a difference between left and right. So I think most of you guys in the room will know that if you're ever going to traverse onto a face and you've got to put in that first turn, if, it, if it's something that intimidates you, you, you kind of hope that you went in on the side that you favour. Um, but we all know as skiers that everybody has a weaker turn direction. With the leg steering range, we look at the inner rotation of the outside leg. So that could also be translated as the downhill leg of the turn. Um, <coughs> and most of the people that we test when we do this usually show up a 20, 25 uh, degree difference between left and right. So 
if you can identify that before someone comes out to the slopes, you, you've got a really good chance of trying to improve their skiing technique before they've got there. And uh, we were talking about this the other day, that, that there is so much that can be done off of snow. And, and I think the future where we want to take this is to have a, a closer relationship with the ski shops, with the, with the ski coaches. And, you know, this isn't just about our academy. This is about someone that goes and spends 500, 600 quid on a lesson in St. Anton and has a, an instructor saying, finish off your turns. And if the person goes to that lesson with a physical restriction on one side of their, their rotation range, they've lost quite a lot of the investment of what that ski lesson might be. So th there are six, uh, sorry, there's six points all together. You, you'll see on, you know, definitely take time to have a look through the website on this and, and we've put a little bit of effort into explaining to people what they can do to help improve these movement patterns. But the idea behind this is that to avoid getting into the queue to see these guys, you know, if, if you can unlock a, a lot of the movement patterns, uh, you'll be a better skier. And, and the guys are making the point as well, you know, get better at skiing anyway. Um, improve your technique, you'll have a better time on the mountain. But this is the stuff that we usually can't fix on a five day course. So if you come on a five day course, we, we can't you know, go through stretching regimes that are intense because it's too intense, too quick. It, these things take weeks, sometimes months. Um, but the awareness alone will, will change it. A lot of people that have tried and tested this can do this at home by themselves. It's, it's not rocket science. Uh, we work you know, with, with Lily and, and, the, and the girls here from Very Via Touch and there's other physios and wherever you, you're based, uh, quite often the education of this will make you sort of think twice and like actually, why isn't that part of my body moving? Um, and skiing's not rocket science. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a few movement patterns that we have to make, but it's, um, it's really interesting for us you know, doing these talks and doing these lectures when we go around you know, on our UK tour to see just how many people which I would say is way over 95%, don't actually have the movement patterns in their body to perform the sport of skiing technically correct. Which is a shame because you could, you know, it would be very easy to sort of uh, highlight that. So that, that's where we're going with the, uh, the Ski Technique Lab. The, the, the future of it is, um, we've got Leo here from Ski Service, uh, <coughs> top boot fitter. We want people in the future to prepare for a ski boot fit, but, but not to walk into a ski shop with um, how do you ski, I'm, I'm, I'm really good, or someone plays themselves down. We want, we want everyone to have a video of how they ski, to know that they can be filmed in the correct way, to go and take it into a ski shop and then get their boot fitted really correctly. Um, because the, the bit that we try to get closer to with this is that the connection between your body and obviously the skis is your ski boot. Um, and it's a really important factor of quite a lot of fundamentals behind this. Um, if you want to find out more about this, go on the website, but most of the stuff you can do yourself, you don't need us as coaches to guide you through it, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but um, this, is the, this is the philosophy behind how we coach, and this is also one of the reasons that we got uh, to know these guys. Um, and I've, I've busted myself up a few times, so this is the other reason these guys are here. So, I, I didn't really want to say too much tonight. This is kind of a future as to where we're trying to take our coaching to, to make relationships with people that can better benefit people. Um, but that's that's it, really. That's uh, th these guys were the sort of the, the these were the money for the night for you guys coming tonight. Um, but that, that's that's it. So we, we're around. If you want to ever ask us questions about it, you can do. Uh, and, and the tests themselves, definitely try and put the time into doing it because you'll probably find that you'll have a very different pattern between your left and right side of the body, and that's the sort of thing we have to turn. We're not in a multi-story car park for skiing, we go left and right, so. Yeah, amazing, um, and thank you guys for coming over, that's really uh, kind to put on the evening for us as well. Um, by the way, we, we did a talk, probably one of the best talks we did uh, on our tour uh, was with these guys, and I think me and Jamie and Rob were sort of sitting there like gobsmacked at watching the information that we gained from hearing these guys talk. Um, but what was interesting for us, it was a room of physios um, and, and interesting for them. They were all quite interested to, to get a better education on this. So, so one of the things about the Ski Technique Lab is uh, there is a, an education program, an expert program. Some of the boot fitters in the UK have gone through it um, and put the stiff up on the wall. Physios that we work with are working through it and gone through it. And um, that would hopefully be the future that the, the, <coughs> the people, not us, but the people that have dealing with the customers that want to get ski fit, 
or want to get a good boot fit, have a better education for this. That's it. So we're good. Yeah.